Hey, everybody. It's me, Father Tom, pastor. I say that pastor because the other, I'm trying to make phone calls to all the parishioners, and it's quite a list. Little by little, I hope to get through them all, so hopefully I'll, if you haven't received a call from me, that means your name's probably in the middle of the pack there in the alphabet. But anyway, I called this one woman with kind of a little conversation, and I don't know if she was hard of hearing, but I'm talking and said, where? I said, St. Teresa. I says, oh, she said, yeah. Well, I'm familiar with the church, but who are you? I said, I'm the pastor. So, oh, <laughs> there's only one pastor, but it's me. So, Father Tom, the pastor. And today be a little different, uh, something I'm not usually accustomed to doing. I haven't done this in a long time. Back in my younger days, I would offer Bible studies to uh, my parishioners, but that's been a long time. And reason probably why I don't continue, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time. It's reading and, you know, taking notes. And honestly, the numbers that usually turn out don't warrant that expensive time. So I chose, I just decided that the time that I do have, I'd rather pour that into a homily where there's a thousand people on a Sunday, all right? And that's probably why, that's truthfully, the other things uh, prevent me from doing that. Plus, we really like you to be in a small group sharing with faith with one another rather than coming, sitting in a desk or you know chair just listening and then usually moving, you know, moving on. So anyway, that's a little preamble there, but small groups where you come together and you share your faith, discuss your faith, all right? Before I go any further, I'd like to begin with a prayer because I'm going to need it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to reach out and touch whoever's watching, will watch. Uh, just a little sharing on your great gift of your divine word that feeds and nourishes and that bless us. And so, Lord, I hope those who hear may be uh, gain some insight, knowledge, but also a way to also to even alter and change their behavior. But that's the bottom line. So we ask this, Lord, in your precious name. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Therese, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hope you don't mind. I think I'm just going to sit. I may be sitting and standing the whole time, but let me just sit down here and uh, begin this little uh, little insight to the God's Word on the Sunday readings. And uh, it's a little challenging because I not consider myself a teacher, more of a storyteller. But here we go. And I I don't like usually looking at notes either. But uh, time doesn't permit me really to commit this to memory. Believe it or not, I'm probably more busy now, <laughs> now that we're closed, than when we open. At least doing different things, trying to, you know, recordings and tapings and readings, and now I'm trying to do something for the children as well, so you have patience with me. So anyway, we're coming to the second Sunday of Easter. You see, Easter, that was last Sunday. Now, a lot of us may think of that, but uh, with the church, Easter is such a big celebration, a big day, that it just can't be contained in just one Sunday. So we have what we call, I think actually seven weeks, we go from Easter, the next 50 days, concluding on Pentecost Sunday, which is 50 days after Easter. So all these days are considered the Easter season, but the week after Easter is the highlight, it's the octave of Easter. And so now we're here on the second Sunday. So I just want to point out to you that uh, what these, these next seven weeks are a little bit different than the weeks during the year is that, you know, in a Mass and our readings, we typically have a reading from the Old Testament, right? Then the psalm response, then the second reading, which is usually a letter from St. Paul, and then the Gospel. And even with the Gospels, each year we have A, B, or C, and this year we're in year A, which is the Gospel of Matthew. And I believe B is Mark, and C is Luke, and then John fits in the other gaps, especially with Mark, which is a much shorter gospel than the others. So what's different this with the Easter readings? If you may notice that the first reading is not from the Old Testament. That's right. It's taken from the, from the Acts of the Apostles. So during the Easter season, we, at least initially in the beginning of these first few weeks, we focus on the resurrection of our Lord, but also with the birth and the growth of the church, culminating with Pentecost Sunday. So there you have it. It's, it's the... Uh, no, no, uh, no Old Testament. And the second reading, as I said, usually it's a letter from St. Paul, 
which are in the Easter season, is what we call the Catholic epistles. Either it could be Peter, James, or John. This year, year A, it's reading from Peter. Again, it speaks about the, uh, the early church. All right, so that's a little background there for you. And now, this iPad always conks out. It's got to find out where we're going here. And let's start with the, this coming Sunday's Gospel. This is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had sent this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, who sends you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen. Oh, I'm sorry, peace be with you. Then Thomas, then excuse me, then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hands and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and through his belief you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. And so this Gospel, by the way, is also read on the second Sunday of Easter. For, for probably two, two main reasons. One, I think because... First and foremost, it ties in with the time frame. You know, with, with the appearance of Thomas, right? We have the Easter Sunday night where he appears to the apostles. There was 10 at the time. Remember, Judas has already left. And then Thomas was absent. So there's 10, and he appeared to them. And they said eight days later, which be the next following Sunday, Sunday night, Jesus appears again to uh, Thomas. So this Sunday sort of marks that same occasion. But also it's fitting because it's a Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, we've been doing the novena, and Divine Mercy began with Sister Faltina, a Polish nun. And mercy is about <laughs> God is merciful, and especially for the forgiveness of our sins. And we hear that highlighted here, that the Lord entrusts his church with the power to forgive sins in his name. Hmm? And so we see this when the Jesus appears to them, and he appears, and the door is locked, and he's able to walk through the door walls. Hmm? even though he has a body, and he says to them, peace be with you, or shalom, which is the normal Jewish greeting. You think they're probably trembling. They were fearful when they saw Jesus because you're thinking, uh-oh, we're in trouble. I mean, Jesus could lay guilt on them, be upset with them, not even raise his voice, but simply saying, you know, hey, Peter, how could you deny me? How could you guys run away from me? I, he did nothing like that. He didn't make them feel any guilty, any shame. He said, peace, peace to them. And then he breathed on them. Hmm? That's interesting. Perhaps he came to each individual. There's only 10 of them. Imagine standing, having the Lord stand before you, the risen Lord. That'd be enough to be frightening, enough. Incredulous would be. But that he breathes. He breathes breath. See, that goes back to the book of Genesis. Remember how God shaped Adam and Eve from the dirt, from the clay? And he breathed in them life. And so here we have the same, the Spirit come upon, and he's bringing, breathing in them life. The spiritual life, this new life, to leave this life of fear, to go out and now to proclaim the good news. And so he sends them out. Hmm? He sends them out to do to his work, to his bidding, to do his mission. 
For that's what apostle means. Apostle means one who was sent. And so now they are sent. Hmm? And let's go a little further now. Now we come to Thomas. I'm a little partial to Thomas because my name is Thomas. And I always feel bad that the poor guy gets a, you know, a bad rap. I mean, you could call this Doubting Thomas or Thomas of Great Faith because there's his proclamation. Which one are you going to focus on? Most of us <laughs> focus on the doubting and not believing. But you can't blame him for not believing. I don't think so. They say, we saw the Lord. I'm thinking, if you saw the Lord, why are you still hiding? Why is the door still locked? Why are you still you know, kept away? No, your behavior hasn't changed, probably. Think, so therefore, I, I don't think you did see him because you would be different. And the name Thomas, what does it mean? It means twin. Maybe he had a twin brother, but nothing's ever mentioned of a brother. I think really twin to me is symbolic. Is that Thomas, we have the doubting, but also a great faith. I think all of us, in a sense, we have that twin side in us, you know? None of us are all good. None of us are all bad. There's, there's a mixture of us. There's a twin in us. Sometimes we can be really charitable, real patient, really kind. Man. Is that really me? And there are occasions like, whoa, was I an idiot? How can I behave such a way? How did I lose my temper? You know? I mean, isn't that all part of us? It's that twins, both of us, you know, inside of all of us. There's two sides. And so we see the side of, of Thomas as well, hmm? his downing side. And Jesus comes and he doesn't scold Thomas either. Hmm? He says, Thomas, put your, you know, if you want, put your hand, touch the wounds. He shows the wounds. For the wounds is the proof that is Jesus. Hmm? Though his body is resurrected and the body will be, you know, redeemed, but the wounds are kept just as a proof. And then Thomas sees that, and what does he, what does he say? The great profession of faith, my Lord and my God. You know, this is the first time since chapter 1 in the Gospel of John that Jesus is proclaimed as God. This is the first time since all the way back from chapter 1. Here we are in chapter 20. Not for anywhere in the gospel, only here at the end. Hmm? Is, is, is his people makes that great profession of faith. But what's even more interesting, hmm? more powerful, right? There's a previously, we, I meant to mention that here we have the beginning of confession, Christ giving his church the power to forgive. And this is incredible. Because one of the reasons why they crucified Christ, remember with the woman anointed his, his feet, she anointed him, and he told the woman, your sins are forgiven. And with that, the Pharisees, go, what? Only God can forgive sins. Hmm? How can he dare claim that ability, that power, that authority? And so that made Jesus on, the, on their wanted list. And so now, human people are able, in a sense, in Jesus' name, to forgive sins. Now, confession is the one that troubles most Catholics with the seven sacraments. We're okay with baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, but confession, we say, why do we have to tell a priest our sin? Why can't I go straight to God? Now, I am not saying that you can't, that God won't forgive unless you go to confession, but it's the norm. And why, though? Because Jesus willed it. He said it right here. Your sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Those you hold bound are held bound. Such a responsibility, such a power. You know, and, and the Reformation had a hard time with that. And John Calvin, one of the reformers there, said, no, 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 Jesus, this is really what was happening, he said, when you preach the good news, people will hear it and then repent of their sins. But this is not a teaching how to preach. This is actually the ability to, to forgive sins. Because we need to hear those words, those definitive words, I absolve you. Hmm? That is the insurance, huh? the confidence that we are forgiven. I remember I used to be chaplain in the hospital in Deland, and it was a Seventh Day Adventist, and they have different chaplains. But the Catholics always wanted a Catholic priest. In fact, the chaplain told me, you know, I can give them the insurance of their faith, but what they want is absolution. <laughs> what they want is absolution to know they are forgiven. And so really, as much as we find it difficult, it's really because it's our pride. You know, we're embarrassed, we're ashamed, you know. What would the person think of me? Hmm? And so we hold back. But we're free when we, you know, can announce our sins, pronounce them, be 
because what you don't, you know, you're as sick as your secrets, and what you don't share, it, it stays within. Once you release it, it's free, and they hear those words. So God did a great, great gift for us. And of course, his divine mercy, and this is what divine mercy is about, to forgive our sins. So anyway, on this gospel here, let me reflect on that. <coughs> the faith of Thomas being sent, that we too, but also this gift of confession. What is my attitude confession? How often do I go to confession? Do I allow my fear, my, my, my pride to prevent me? Jesus knew what he was doing when he gave the power to forgive sins, that we may live this life in peace and be assured of the life to come. Anyway, so that's the gospel. And I do like to take a little look at the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 2, 42 to 47. One of my favorite readings. You want to understand how the church was like? Read this section here. But let me also add, it's the ideal the way the church was. You know, Not everybody lived up this great standard. We think, whoa, you know, everybody's perfect. Because uh, we read later, hell, people actually didn't live up to that high standard. But this is a good portion of it. So let me read here. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, the breaking of the bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So this is really quite the life here when they're living. Hmm? And one part when at least stands out for me is the generosity of the early church. Wow. Hmm? Think about that. They would sell their property and possessions and just divide among all those according to their need. I guess they were really a Christian communist in a way, really. That's how they were living. Those who needed, they received. And it's funny now, we, we talk about stewardship, not that's funny, but we talk about stewardship sharing our time, talent, and our treasure. And now all of a sudden, the Catholic Church speaks about the word, what do we call it, tithe? Hmm? Yeah, right? I never heard that word growing up. I <laughs> never spoke about it. It means really one-tenth. Tithe is one-tenth. And that's found in the Old Testament and and so there's always debate. Are Christians bound to tithe one-tenth? And after reading, there's difference of opinion. But what I have read and what I believe is that we're not really bound to do the one-tenth tithe. That's of the Old Testament. We don't hold ourselves bound to the other laws, the commands of the Old Testament. We are free. We are, you know, live, live, by, the, live by the Spirit. But what we are called to do, all right, is to be generous. That, my friend, is what we're called to do. You know, what is generous for one may be, you know, be easy for another, but to live the generous life. Here they sold their possessions, you know. You really want to see how the faith takes hold of all the things that are really your generosity. And I might have said it before, but in my own spiritual life, I've done Bible studies, reading the Bible and the prayers. My greatest growth is in this area here. Mm -hmm becoming more generous, you know, trusting God, you know, letting God lead. And so, I, you know, even in these difficult times, we're still called to be generous. God will provide, God will take care, and that's at the early church, and that's why I think why they grew. Hmm? Of course, they had joy, there was a spirit among them, but they noticed their, wow, you want to get someone's attention, you know, watch someone's generosity. So that's really important as well. But then they also leave these four, four points here. And what does it mean to be really part of the church? Hmm? Hold on here. I highlighted here in my, uh, let me see, these four points. I know them, but I'll just make sure here. <laughs> All right, here we go. Where are they now? <sighs> Trying to be fancy with using my, Okay, so what was the early church like? This is here. This, this four points, right? Teaching of the apostles. All right. Teaching of the apostles. You like my handwriting? I'm probably blocking it right now. So we have the teaching of the apostles, uh, communal life, breaking the bread, 
great thing about it. I'm probably blocking it. Full of genius used the blackboard, but he had much better handwriting than I had and the prayers. All right. These are the four ingredients right there. There you go. Hmm. The early church these committed themselves to these four things. What were they? They were the teaching of the apostles, communal life, the breaking of the bread, and prayers. Teaching of the apostles. That's mean the teaching of the church. Okay? Teaching of the apostles, the teaching of the church, the, even with the, your own parish life where the priest may preach, whatever. But also the doctrine of our churches that we have. Passed down from the, from the Vatican, what we hold for all these 2,000 years. That's part of the teaching of the apostles, communal life. Now, we probably feel it right now about communal life. We probably never thought too much about it. But right now, we're living in isolation. And we said, boy, I can't take it. I want to be with people again. I want to be back in church. I want to be back in mass. It's one thing watching it on, t on my computer or on TV, but it's definitely not the same. And it's not just, hopefully, it's not just because, you know, you can't receive communion, as important as that may be, as special as that, of course. But the communal life is being with others, sharing the faith, being bolstered together, supporting one another the communal life, and they came together. You know, they'd say, like, one monkey is no monkey, one Christian is really no Christian. We gotta, we're meant to become together in the communal life. And communal life is more than simply going to Mass. It's what we talk about being part of a small group. We're reluctant to join a small group, but that makes us in a community life with others that we can share our faith. It's hard in the whole church where there's four or 500 people. Small group is part of the early church. And the communal life is also not simply meeting tending church. It's also mean communal life is when we gather for different occasions, but also in a ministry. That's part of the community life, doing things together, helping the poor communal life. Breaking of the bread. Now, when I eat Italian bread, I like not using a knife. I like just breaking it off with my hand. Now, I guess with germs, that would be a thing of the past. We're afraid to even touch the bread, but it's something about just breaking it off. Hmm? But that's not what that means, the breaking of the bread, you know, at lunch or dinner. Breaking of the bread is... A what they use for the word Eucharist, okay? What we would call, you know, coming together for Mass, the Eucharist. Okay, that's the breaking the bread. And for us as Catholics, we are asked, required, expected to come every Sunday, not most Sundays, you know, not when we can, not when it's convenient, but that make that commitment that we will come together because we live in community, and we live in community when we're there for each other. When one's missing, we are, we are affected by it. So we'd come to the breaking the bread of the Eucharist and then prayers. Praying together. I tried at times on the Friday night to have different prayer gatherings, but personal prayer, private prayer that you give each, each, each day praying. We pray together when we come to Mass, but also praying on your own. And these are the four things. Ask yourself, where do you stand? Do you have all the four? Are you faithful to the teaching of the apostles? Some people say, you know what, I like the communal life, but you know, there's some things I just don't want to accept about that. Uh, no, it doesn't work. You've got to do that. There's some people who really feel, you know what? Let's say communal life. Yeah, I'll come together with those big special occasions. In fact, I don't even mind doing ministry. I'll be happy to help. But to come to Mass, uh, that's not for me. It's fine that you're doing that. But you're not really totally committed to the church. It's not enough simply to do nice things. It's be part of that. Hmm? Some people come to the Eucharist. They want to receive Jesus, but they have no interest in others, really. They want to come by themselves and lead by themselves, and they don't really be part. They don't really, you know, be active in the life of the church. They're really living, living on the, really, in a sense, isolated, though, among people, alone, but with others. And then prayers. You know, we got to pray. Prayer is the source of our life. And so we look at these four things here. Now, how do I measure up? Because now, too often, we pick and choose what we want to do, what we believe in. And say, no, no, you got to be universal means, you know, holy together, you know, all together. So this is part of our life, that we are faithful to the teaching, whether I agree necessarily. I may not always agree with it. I may not always like it, but I accept it in faith. Hmm? I accept that in faith. This is the teaching of the church that's been handed down for 2,000 years, communal life. We come together on Sundays and other occasions and being active, small group, and doing ministry. And of course, the highlight is the Eucharist, which we feel now the lack of, and then having a prayer life. So that way, I just leave that to you now. And anyway, I hope this helped. Again, I'm learning as I do this, so I thank you for tuning in. And uh, may you all be filled with the Holy Spirit and live a generous life. Hmm? And may you pray those words of Thomas, my Lord and my God.
Lord bless and keep you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.